Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you uh, for those people listening in. Uh, I don't know if any of you heard me um, on the last uh, uh, presentation I gave following our listing. Um, so we listed in March. Um, perhaps some of you were, were on that. Um, anyway, I, I, I've kept um, my presentation pretty short, five pages, really to encourage more questions and conversation. Um, and also because we're so rapidly growing and evolving, um, it, 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 it's sort of almost any presentation I do is sort of out of date by the time I've done it. Um, so we're, we're, we're a rapidly growing company and most importantly in what is a rapidly growing industry or sector, i.e. the wealth management um, uh, uh, sector. It's secular growth and that's the important thing I think uh, that makes the sector attractive. It's secular. Why is it secular? It's secular on so many different levels. Um, you know, firstly, there's an increasing um, self-reliance uh, being placed on all of us regarding our future finances, be that in pensions or savings. Um, uh, and it's not just happening in the UK, it's, it's, it's pretty much a worldwide or developed world phenomenon. The second most important thing is that we are in the foothills of the largest intergenerational transfer of wealth uh, history has seen. Um, the ECB estimates that 55% of Europe's wealth is in the hands of people over the age of 55. Um, you know, just over, uh, 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 you know, it's all about basically the baby boomers and the baby boomers uh, as a generation in the developed world are probably the wealthiest per capita generation ever. Um, thirdly, we're seeing rising savings ratios and have been for a while, not just because of the pandemic, as David Smith alluded to in his presentation. We're also seeing wealth creation happening far more rapidly. Um, gone are the days where, you know, it took 10, 20 years to build a business. In today's world, with the digitization and the sort of technocrasm, as I call it, that's happening, um you're seeing people get wealthy quite quickly um why offshore basically offshore because um it's tax neutral jersey because um it's a stable political um uh, uh jurisdiction um it has all the infrastructure required um and uh in terms of team uh we we have tremendous corporate strength and depth uh, and I would particularly highlight our two key shareholders uh, Andy Bruffett Schroeder Asset Management and Giles Hargreaves and Guy Feld at uh, Marlborough Funds um, and then if you go down the rest of our shareholders there a list of um, uh, uh, well-known market participants anyway um, if I move on to the presentation uh, quick present quick uh, disclaimer. So this morning we announced um, uh, an acquisition and our final results to the September year end. The acquisition that we announced today follows on from the acquisition of JCAP um, that completed on the 2nd of July. JCAP is a business that's focused on treasury management and the reason why we wanted to buy that was because long established business um, very good market share in Jersey and Guernsey um, was it was a bit of a hedge on interest rates going up. I can't tell you that at the time we thought that interest rates might be going up quite as quickly as they would seem to be. But the view was that rates were nearer to the point of going up than, than they had been for a while. Um, the that business will benefit from rates going up because when there is a return from cash deposits, people will be looking for management of their cash to maximize those returns. Omega takes us down into a, a different part of our client reach, 
So Amiga is, um, uh, again, very well established, well-known name in, in Jersey and Guernsey. Um, it's a straightforward um, uh, IFA, but mainly focuses on retirement planning. Um, there is some mortgage advice, life, et cetera, but it mainly focuses on um, pension planning uh, in particular. And again, here in Jersey, uh, uh, we, we're seeing the same uh, momentum towards greater self-reliance. It, um, it also gives us the ability to service our existing client base within the wealth management um, business to offer pensions advice and gives us all the necessary approvals and licenses. In terms of the financials, uh, they're a little bit muddy because of the listing, because we absorbed all the costs of the listing in, 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 in the year. Um, but I'm pleased to say that AUM has grown, will grow further as a result of the um, acquisition of Omega. Um, our cash under advice, so this is the JCAP business, that has grown as well. So we have about 1.6 billion um, out on deposit with various banks, managing it for a range of clients from uh, wealthy individuals, our own pooled cash accounts, um, to uh, charities, family offices, um, uh, and uh, utilities. So the assets have grown on the assets under management and advice have grown, revenues grown, full-time staff members grown. Um, uh, we've got cash in the bank uh, currently and we're in a pretty healthy financial state our balance sheet strong so really the point behind this um presentation uh which was done which i completed for um presenting to our existing shareholders is really it's a bit of a tick box you know yes we've delivered on our listing um uh, promises if you like uh we're, we're, we're looking at both onshore and offshore because of the secular growth. Um, we believe that there is a place for uh, independent boutique, um, perhaps because you are seeing this intergenerational wealth transfer beginning. Some of the incumbents, well-known names, um, may be looking a little tired uh, and um, perhaps don't suit the, the, the sort of uh, characteristics of, should we call them the, the millennials that are going to be inheriting this wealth. Um, we like the idea of giving our clients more and more products and services. Uh, you know, you grow your business. Um, it's a lot easier to grow your business from existing clients than it is to go out and get new clients. You know, cost of client acquisition is actually time, the selling cycle to get new clients can be very long. Um, we are definitely looking at expanding into other crown dependencies and what are broadly termed international finance sectors, centers. Um, and I think that what the last six months have demonstrated is that we can identify good value acquisitions, um, particularly uh, offshore, uh, it's a less crowded space in terms of, at the moment in the UK, there's a lot of money around to buy up, particularly IFAs from the private equity world. Um, that is not so much the case in international finance sectors. Um, we have a very well articulated, defined pipeline of acquisitions, two of which are at heads of terms. Um, we've got lots of inward bound calls from senior um, advisors and staff uh, currently working in other uh, uh, um, businesses, particularly those that are a bit more established. And I think that one of the questions I get asked is why did you go down the listed route and why didn't you follow what a lot of other people have done, which is go and get yourself some private equity backing. I, I think that there are lots of good reasons to be listed um, that outweigh some of the um, negatives. Uh, being a micro cap, the negatives are that your share price can be affected by a very small volume of, of, of shares. Um, and by the way, my background is for 30 odd years, I was an investment banker. Um, 
advising extremely large companies. Um, uh, so I was aware of this, but but the advantages are that um, for our clients, um, they sort of take on a bit of pride, the fact that the company that looks after their money is, is listed, gives you greater transparency, it keeps the regulators happy um, because of that. Um, but for the staff and for people looking to join, um, there's the incentivization aspect. And then for businesses looking to sell, a lot of these businesses tend to be businesses where the larger shareholders were the founders and the junior shareholders, if you like, are, are younger and don't have the financial wherewithal to buy out the the older shareholders um, and so there is some tension there um, by having an equity alternative uh, we can reward the people that are going to stay in the business and you know it's to excuse the pun you know they become part of the team we move as a team we share the pain and the gain as a team uh, and um, it's a lot easier to grow a business of our size in this sector than it is to try and move a super tanker um, like you know a uh, 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 Hargreaves Lansdowne or St James's Place or, 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 or you know Quilters. Um, thank you Mark, good to see you. Okay, you. I can go straight into questions for you. Um, who is your client base in terms of the sectors you're aiming? ESG, bio, etc. What sectors are you targeting in particular? So our investment process and procedure um, has front and center ESG considerations. Um, for example, our international equity fund is about to be granted Article 8. Um, we uh, we manage a ESG bond fund, which is one of the oldest and longest running bond fund funds. It's a Liechtenstein use. It's called the Kiox ESG bond fund. Um, we uh, so we believe that a strong ESG process within the investment process is. Uh, for our clients is 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 an essential critical part okay and uh, we're leading, leading on from that uh, there are obviously other asset management uh, companies um, targeting esg what makes um a team uh, different for usp sorry we don't target esg we just think that that's the way money should be run we, right. we don't hold up our we, we're not badge wearers we think that a lot of the businesses that wear the badge mm -hmm. aren't necessarily quite as um, uh, uh, as true to the badge. So we do not market under the branding ESG. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that we believe in, in terms of the, so, you know, the business is sort of at its core, an investment management business um, that has these allied services around it um, as, if you like, channels by which clients come to us so in the investment management side of it our investment philosophy is very straightforward and it is that um, the last 20 to 30 years investment returns have been driven mainly by financial assets part of that as a result of um, you know more particularly since the great financial crisis um, the, the the returns that you've seen from the bond market in particular where bonds have behaved more like equities than historically. Um, uh, 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 we believe that the investment returns for the next 20 years are not going to be driven by financial assets, but are going to be driven far more by real assets. So our whole investment process is orientated towards um, building blocks in our, in our models um, of which we only run three. We don't have a litany of different models. Um, we just stick to straightforward, balanced growth and diversified income. Um, and they are all driven by um, primarily a menu card of assets that we select 
and we are helped in that asset selection um, through some data science. Okay. Do you have currently have a dividend policy or is that planned in the short term, long term? Absolutely, not in the short term. Um, you know, it wasn't in our prospectus or our listing, our admission document. Um, I think that uh, paying a dividend is a great demonstration of your strength and the fact that you're actually generating some cash earnings. Mm -hmm. um, to be slightly more selfish, I own 20% of the company, so I'd welcome a dividend from time to time. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, it's part of growing up, isn't it? You know, when yeah. we start wearing our long trousers and go to big school, um, we'll start paying a dividend. But okay. I, I, I can't tell you when that will be. Um, uh, but it will certainly be something very much in my mind as executive chairman. Okay. Now you mentioned about the pipeline and future developments uh, and acquisitions. Um, yeah. In terms of in terms of um, uh, cash in bank and the, the the capex, how's that going to affect the business going forward? So we have um, very strong and loyal support from our institutional shareholders, um, who are long term and how can I put it? Look. You know, Andy, Andy at Schroeder's and Giles and Guy at Marlborough, that, that, that they haven't taken a 9.8% stake and a 8.7% stake in a 13 million pound company um, to just sit there. You know, they, yeah. that, that, that the listing was all predicated on the fact that we were going to be part buy and build and part organic they're supportive of that um and i would say that every single shareholder on the register understands that we will be needing to raise money again um to finance that acquisition pipeline um and all are very willing to do so on the basis that you know the prices that we have been paying have looked relatively attractive versus the prices that other people have been paying for particularly equivalent and I would argue lesser quality businesses in the UK. Okay. Um, you know, um, your next question is probably going to be would you have ever have any debt? The answer to that is yes. But yes, we, yes, that's right. We have an undertaking with our major shareholders that um, we wouldn't overgear. And what does overgear mean? Um, overgear means probably no more than two times. Okay. And I, I that, that, you know, I, I think that for businesses that we acquire, mm -hmm. that it, it's going to be because the hearts and minds of a big element of their ownership wants to stay in the business. And because we'll be able to use equity to finance it, it, it sort of helps mitigate against what, what we call seller's remorse. You know, oh, I shouldn't have sold the business this year. I should have waited another year because we're going to grow and we've just sold our futures. So having those having those shares to be able to use as acquisition currency or coinage helps you when you're talking to these sorts of people. Um, you know, and that was very much, you know, that's very much what's coming through from the conversations that we're having. Okay, so just going back to your um, answer about um, raising equity further down the line, are we looking at more institutions to back, back that up or are you opening up to more retail interest? Both. Uh, I, I come from, you know, I come from the days when private clients were given um, a great deal more respect. <clears throat> 
And I don't want to turn this into a party political broadcast, but I think the London Stock Exchange slash the regulators have made it very, very difficult for what at the end of the day was, and in my opinion, continues to be the bedrock of the London Stock Exchange, i.e. the private client, whether the private client is doing it directly or whether the private client is investing indirectly via something like, you, you know, David Smith's fund. Um, and the biggest difference, and I think that one of the reasons why the London stock market trades at a discount to, say, the S&P, um, as, as again, David alluded to in his point about the London market, is because in America, the private client is, is far more respected, is given far more access, um, and is far more engaged directly with the stock market. And private clients tend to be a lot more longer term. Yes, you've got day traders, but you know, mm. so, so the answer to your question is I couldn't get, I couldn't engage with the private client world at the listing point. Um, but now I can, and it's very much something that I would want to do alongside expanding the shareholder base institutionally. And in fact, on Friday morning, I'm giving a presentation to uh, the inst to uh, the institutional desk of our nomad. Um, and we have a number of other brokers that are interested in what we're doing. And, you know, when the time comes, we may well, you know, I don't like to go banging the drum when there's nothing to bang the drum about. Um, but the, the answer to your question is both. But I have a particular leaning, you know, at the end of the day, our clients are private clients, you know. Yeah. Yeah. OK, um, I think we're pretty much on time there, Mark. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation this evening and answering the questions. I'm sorry if I couldn't get any more questions in for you, but um, we will say. Well, I'll give you one last thought, though. So yes, go how, good, how good do I feel about our prospects? Mm -hmm. Well, I couldn't possibly comment, but. <laughs> done nothing but buy shares myself personally not through an option scheme or anything funny like that money out of my wallet um and i did so again today um yeah. and you know thank you very much there's so much more to cover i would also just leave you with one other thought in terms of the growth potential mm -hmm. think about brexit yes right and think about the expat community in Portugal, southern Spain, south of France, Balearics. Yeah. Um, yeah. What Brexit has done is it is forcing them down the route of QROPs, QNUPs, international savings plans. Yeah. And QROPs, QNUPs, international savings plans require your assets, i.e. your pension scheme, to be custodied not in the UK and preferably in an international finance centre and be managed in that jurisdiction. Right. So okay. There, there's plenty to go for. Excellent, Mark. Thank you for that last point. I'm sure it'll be picked up by our listeners and appreciate your time this evening. Thank you, and thank you, listeners. Good night to you.